What's going on? Thank you so much for joining us today at Bayside Church Online. We know you could have gone so many different places, but you decide to be here with us, and we don't take that for granted. If you don't know, we've been traveling through the book of Romans, and today we land in Romans chapter 9. Many would call us the deep water of the book of Romans because we go into some heavy matters. But the good news is we've got a wonderful preacher, teacher, and pastor that's going to be sharing with us today, and his name is Mark Clark. He's going to answer this question for us. Is our salvation a result of God choosing some and not choosing others? Do we choose God or does he choose us? These are big questions of the gospel, and Mark Clark is going to help us discover that today. Stay tuned, pay attention, take notes, but most importantly, let God work on your heart as you hear this message. Oh, my name is Pastor Mark. Really good to have you guys here. How you doing? You doing good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so here we are, Romans chapter nine. And to be dead honest with you, guys, we're gonna get, this is gonna get heated, man. This is, this is heavy. I'm just telling you right now, remember that show? Uh, you guys uh, ever watch American Gladiator? Yeah. All right, so that show was like all these crazy things in the 80s. I remember watching as a kid and there was this thing called the gauntlet and you went through the gauntlet and people would just smash you with big things and try to like knock you down. That is literally what this Bible text is gonna do to us tonight. It is gonna knock us down, beat us up, uh, cause it's actually really hard and really heavy stuff to understand. So hopefully uh, you guys are ready to use your brains a little bit. Uh, it's, it's very interesting actually. And, and welcome to you who are online campus as well. So glad you guys are here uh, for this. And if you are new, a special welcome to you. Make sure uh, that you let us know you're here. We are super excited that you are journeying with us through the book of Romans. So if you got a Bible, Romans chapter nine is where we are. And um, like I said, a difficult passage, a heavy passage, one that like, um, so, I mean, it's like, this, this is a passage that people have ended up in padded rooms throughout history, throughout Christianity. I mean, these guys, it's crazy. And people are like, I don't know what to do with this. This is crazy. So they give it to the new guy on week five, which is insane. And I wasn't supposed to be assigned it. Kurt was supposed to be assigned it, but he calls me up last week. He goes, sorry, I got to do something. I'm like, yeah, you have to do something. Yeah, I bet you do. You got you to gotta sit here all weekend in, in, in big glasses and a mustache hiding out, trying to figure out what I'm going to say about Romans 9, you jerk. But anyways, so, so here's the deal. It is, it is kind of a hard text, and, but, but we got to use our heads. And, and here's kind of what gives me hope is that um, I remember like, I mean, you guys have been in high school. You got into chemistry. You got to use your brain. I remember I, I had to go to English class and recite. I had to figure out Romeo and Juliet, right? The opening stanza. We had to memorize that thing. Two households, both alike in dignity and fair Verona, where we lay our scene from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. All right, this is what I had to do with my life, all right? So if I could use my brain to memorize Shakespeare, we can certainly use it to hone in and try to figure out what's going on Romans 9. So here we are. We got to use our brain. We got to jump into this thing. It starts in verse 6. Romans 9 verse 6, our, at least what we're going to cover starts in verse 6. And he says this. He says, um, it is not as though God's word had failed. So he raises this question of God's plan failing. And that's a really important thing to raise because here's the reality in life. The reality is there are some plans that are really good and some plans that are not as good as other plans. I was trying to take a flight a couple weeks ago, a United flight uh, up to Vancouver and it was rammed. The airports are crazy right now and we're sitting there and it was literally a two hour, hour and a half, two hour wait just to go to, to, to check my bag. And everyone's like sitting there and they're doing stuff with the computers. No one, and everyone's frustrated. Straight, finally, the lady behind the desk just goes, okay, whoever has been here the longest can come forward, all right? That's just a dumb plan, all right? Because 300 people just run and charge the desk, all right? That's just dumb, all right? So, so there are plans that are better than other plans. And what started to happen is people started to say, okay, so, so uh, there was creation, and then there was the fall, and then God called this people Israel, the Jews, and for thousands of years, they were the covenant people of God. They were the ones that were redeemed. They were the saved ones, and they were ministering. They were to be the light of the world. And what happened when Jesus came is now he's died, and he's resurrected, and this Holy Spirit comes, and it's, the Jews aren't really believing. There's some Jews that are, but some Jews that aren't. And, and they're really going, man, is this actually a good plan? 
I don't think this is necessarily a good plan. In fact, it looks as if God's word has failed. It looks like the Jews aren't coming to Jesus. It looks like this plan was bad. And maybe just even more generically than that, maybe you're here and you're exploring Christianity, really glad that you're here. Um, and maybe you're thinking, man, the plan of God is just bad in general. Like I look around the world, I see brokenness, I see pain. I look at, and I'm just thinking this might not, maybe God doesn't exist or maybe God's plan is just a bad plan to begin with. Maybe it has failed. And what Paul says is, no guys, guys, you gotta understand. I know it looks like maybe God's word has failed. I know it looks like his plan has failed, but it actually hasn't failed. And he's gonna go on to chapter 11 to explain why that is. But he raises it here and he goes, it just looks different than what we thought it might actually look like. That yes, a bunch of Jews haven't believed in Jesus, but does that mean that God is unjust? Does that mean his plan is failing? And if so, then his plan is gonna fail in your life. And he says, listen, no, 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 that's not the answer. Not at all. For no, and here's the reason. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Now, I'm sure you wake up in the morning thinking about this question all day. I wonder who Israel is. Probably not what you're thinking about, but this is what Paul actually has to deal with. And that's why I'm saying this is a little more difficult because it's like summertime and we just want to go boating and we're like, I don't know about this question. So we just got to hone in and understand sometimes the Bible isn't written to you, right? It's written for you but it might not be written to you immediately, which is why you're reading Leviticus and you get bored sometimes when it's 20 chapters on, you shouldn't eat fel shellfish. And you're like, I don't know why I like that. All right, <laughs> because sometimes the Bible's trying to do something to a particular culture and answer the question. So he says, listen, the, the reality is it looks like no Jews are coming to Jesus. It looks like Israel has failed. And he goes, guys, here's the reality. Here's why God's word has not failed. Because it is the case that it was never the case that all Jews were actually the people of God. There was always the case that some Jews were the people of God. So this is his point. Verse seven, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary. So he's saying, just because you're physically descended from Abraham doesn't actually mean you're a covenant person of God. That's his point. So he's saying, listen, God's plan hasn't failed. It's just always been this way. That just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're part of the covenant people of God. That's his point. It is similar to if someone walked in here right now to Bayside Church and said, okay, we're trying to figure out all the Christians in California. Hey, someone from the government comes in, God forbid, and they come in and they go, <laughs> and they come in and they go, I'm trying to figure out all the Christians in California. And they just counted up the amount of heads in this room and went, okay, that's how many Christians are in this church. That would be a little bizarre because you know, all of you are on different spectrums of belief. Some of you are like totally in, you're believers, you've been believers your whole life. Others of you are skeptics, you're agnostics, you're atheists. First time I ever walked into a church, I wasn't there to meet Jesus. I was there to meet Girls, all right, that's the reality. So I was there to meet girls and I, and I met, but I was, I was literally eating pizza in the back pew and drinking a Coke and I got kicked out of church the first time I ever walked into church. So if someone just walked in and counted heads, that's not actually the reality. Because like, some of you here, you're just exploring. Others of you think you know Jesus, but you actually don't. And this is what he's talking about here. Just because you're descended from Abraham, the Jews, doesn't, it never meant that they were actually true believers at all. It means you have to actually, there is an Israel within an Israel. There was the true Israel that actually loved and followed God, just like in the church today, there are people who, some of you think you're believers, because you've been going to church or you do your Oswald Chambers in the morning and you give your 5% and you pretend it's 10% and whatever you do and you think you're a Christian, but you don't actually know him. You don't walk with him. You don't know the God of the universe. You just come to church and you think you are. And this is what Paul's saying. It's always been this way. And this is why even if you look at the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus, it's fascinating when you read the gospels, Jesus is constantly trying to distance himself from her, right? Or the story, hey, I want you to turn the water and wine. Woman, all right, this is what he calls her. Woman, why do you bother me with this, right? Don't bother me, I'm busy. And then why does he do that? Very important because he's trying to say, mom, just because you're my mom doesn't mean you're in the kingdom. You got to come in through me too. Just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you're a covenant member. And Paul says, this has always been the case. And because it's always been the case, 
God's word has not failed. It's just continuing on that this is the actual plan. Proximity to Jesus, proximity to the Bible, proximity to church is not what saves you. If it did, Judas would be the most saved. How many of you, you guys know the story of Judas, right? Judas hung out with Jesus for three years and ended up denying him, sold him out. He was around Jesus, watched him, smelt him, saw him, still never warmed him to the God of the universe. That could be you. Judas himself actually denied the God of the Bible. So here's, you could read Philip Yancey. You could, you could listen to Hillsong every day of your life. You could read Beth Moore, do Bible studies, get the booklet out, read the problem of God, problem of Jesus, now available on Amazon. You could read all the... <laughs> <laughs> right? These are, you can do that, man. You could go to base, you could get baseline tattooed on your face, right? <laughs> you could do all of the things that you think are actually good, right? You could, you could memorize sermons. You could go to small groups three days a week. It won't save you. Church can't save you. Works can't save you. Religion can't save you. And it's a scary thing because you can be close but not in. That's what he's trying to say. You can be part of Israel, but not actually Israel. That's what he, and he's saying it's always been this way. You could be in the proximity to godly people and it still never warm you to the God of the Bible. That's his point. It's a very scary thing. I remember going to church. I I got up on a stage. I preached a sermon. I was probably 25 years old. And this old guy walked up to me after. He's like, listen, son, you probably said some really good things up there but I never heard any of them because you were wearing jeans. You gotta wear God's best. You gotta wear God's best. And I was like, man. And here, here's the profound thing that hit me. I wasn't trying to bust this guy's chops. I'm just realizing in my own soul, um, there are multiple ways you can be lost, guys. You can be lost like we think there's only one way to be lost. As church people, we think those pagans out there who vote that way and think that way about sexuality and do this and do that, they're lost. But there is a way that the godliest person in this room can be lost. And you don't hear from God because the preacher's wearing jeans. You're lost, man. You can be lost and serve on this worship team. You can be lost and serve on this preaching team. Pastor Kurt might be. Just by giving me this text, I'm not sure of the guy's salvation at this point. (laughs) Like, what are we saying? You can, if you don't, his point is, man, just being descended, just being close to a thing, that's not actually what saves you. And so he goes, it's always been this way. And then he starts to give illustrations and use the Old Testament story to share that exact reality. So he says, on the contrary, so he's already said Abraham. Now, who are, the, who, are the, who are the three patriarchs when you talk about the Old Testament? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So here's what the apostle Paul is about to do. He's about to tell their story to show us that just being in proximity to the people doesn't actually make you a people of God. And so he says, we started with Abraham. Just because you're, you're, you're fleshly born of Abraham doesn't mean you're truly Abraham's child. That's his first point. Then he goes, okay, let's, let's continue the story. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more gauntlety, a little more difficult. And then it's gonna come out of the blue and hit us with something that's not gonna make us feel comfortable in our Western culture. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. You guys know the story? You have Abraham. Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. Kevin knew I would sing. He didn't even know what I was doing. He didn't even, he, I, unbelievable. So <laughs> Isaac, now here's the reality. Um, you have Abraham and then you have Isaac. Now, is Isaac Abraham's only son at this point? No, you got him. Remember he went and slept with the younger. Sarah couldn't get pregnant. So she's like, oh, my womb's all messed up. You can go sleep with the younger girl and Abraham's, oh shoot, okay. All right, so he goes over (laughs) and he sleeps with the younger girl and she has Ishmael. But God says, "Uh, no, it's not through Ishmael that I want to do the covenant. And so he goes through Isaac. And so we got Abraham and we got Isaac. 
And God says, it's through Isaac that I'm gonna build this covenant people. And we say to ourselves, well, it must mean that Isaac was better than Ishmael in some way. It must mean that he was more moral. It must mean that he had this view on immigration or this view on vaccines or this kind of morality figured out or this kind of church life. He must have been a better person. And God's, no, no, no. He was actually the younger of the two, which in that culture was upside down. Because in that culture, you always did everything with the older one, right? The firstborn got all the money, got all the land, got all the responsibility. And God continuously through Genesis, this was called primogeniture. The the, the primary uh, inheritance was the first person. Um, God constantly goes for the younger one, which is crazy. And so encouraging to the people in this room because you don't have your life in order and God comes and he works with the people, the marginalized, the dummies, the useless people, the people who are like, I could never do anything. God goes, oh no, no, that's exactly who I want to use. I want to use the Isaacs, right? I want to use the people who don't think anything of themselves. Do you notice this? That in high school, you have all the cool guys, right? The jocks, the cool dudes, going to parties, and then you got the geeks, right? And the geeks are like, I got 100% in chemistry. And everyone's like, nah, right? (laughs) But then fast forward 20 years, and all those jocks are working for the geeks, right? And the geeks are balling, right? And the jocks are like, hey, uh, boss, can I get a day off? No, remember you punched me in high school? Go back to work, fool, right? That's... That's what God's about, man. He loves grabbing the geeks, right? The losers in the corner, the marginalized, the guy no one's looking at. And he goes, it is through you that I am gonna bring redemption to the world. Isaac, not Ishmael. It's Isaac that I'm gonna use, not Ishmael. And you feel small and forgotten, but God uses you. Okay, so you got Abraham and then you got Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it's not the children by the physical descent who are God's children, but it's the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Making the same point. Then he jumps into verse seven and he starts to make the same point about the third guy, Jacob. Verse 11, yet before the twins were born. Okay, who are the twins? Jacob and who? Esau, before the twins were... Okay, so let's talk about Jacob and Esau for a second. Jacob and Esau. If you don't know the story, you knew the church, awesome. It's in Genesis 25, go read it. It's a fantastic story. You got Jacob, Esau, they're, they're in the womb together. And you'd think God would look at them and go, look at these guys, they're so cute. And they gag, 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 go, go, go. And God's like, oh God, you guys are awesome. I love you. And I'm gonna use both of you to change the world. But the problem is he only uses one of them. He says, I'm gonna choose Jacob. So they'd done nothing good or bad in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by the works by him who calls. She was told the older will, uh, the, the, the older will serve the younger. Flipped it all up on its head. And then it says, uh, just as it's written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. I'll get to that in a second. So God uses Jacob, not Esau. And we think we love a version of God where he chooses both of them. Where he'd choose Isaac and Ishmael but he only chooses Isaac. And that starts to bug us. And so the gauntlet begins. Why would God choose one and not another? And we start, because how do we choose? Like he says, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, they hadn't done anything yet. Now here's how we think as parents. We think utilitarian about our kids, right? What would this kid be good at? Let's get them to do that, right? So, okay, so uh, this Friday night, um, we're sitting, uh, Friday during the day, we're sitting outside working yesterday, and, uh, and I hear this little thing <laughs> under this little box in my backyard. I'm like, what is that? And my dog starts to, rah, 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 rah. and I'm like, what is this dog doing? Rah, rah, rah. And all of a sudden, I go inside, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So my middle daughter goes out, Hayden, and she looks under this box, and she just goes, whoo, stark white, right? And she's already a super white kid, so just really, really white. And I'm like, oh my goodness. She runs inside, she goes, skunk, skunk, under the thing, skunk. I'm like, oh my goodness. So for the next hour and a half of our life, we got to face off with the skunk. So skunk's under there, dog's barking, but none of us want to go out because we don't want to get sprayed. We're going to get the dog to get sprayed. So it's just chaos. I'm 
So my middle two are sitting on in a corner just crying, don't let the dog get sprayed. I'm screaming orders, do this, do this. Ah! My wife is recording it for Instagram, all right? <laughs> no joke, no joke. That's what's going on. And, uh, and, my, and I all of a sudden start to go, well, how am I gonna solve this? So I look to my oldest, She's got the most muscle. She, utilitarian wise, she's going to be the best. And I grab her. I said, we're going to go get this. So we go out and we're in the garage and we got this big pool thing and we're, we're, we're poking this big box to try to, and then look, no, it's not working. And then we're spraying with the hose. And finally she's like, why don't we have a brother? <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> right? Oh man. Well, finally we got it. And the point is, that's how we use our kids. That's how we think. We're like, you're good at this. You're going to do that. And so that's how we think God functions. He's going to look at Jacob and he's going to say, Jacob, I'm going to use you because you're great. But it's not actually what he does. He says, God, the, the text says Jacob hadn't even done anything yet. And this is how salvation works for us too. It's not based on our past. It's not based on how many people you slept with or didn't sleep with and how many mistakes you've made, and how difficult. Salvation is about one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread, and you did not earn an inch of it. This is where Paul's starting to go, and where it's gonna get difficult. Because we like to think of ourselves as good people, and God blessed me and saved me because I was good because I was moral, because I come from good stock. And what did he just say? The twins were born, and they hadn't done anything good or bad yet. God wasn't looking at their life, saying, you've been a good person, now I will save you. They weren't even born yet. And this is where Jesus speaks and goes, he says, you wanna hear a crazy passage that none of us have on our fridge? Listen to this. Matthew 21. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. What? Guarantee you don't believe that. Guarantee you don't believe the prostitutes are going to heaven in front of you. There's this guy, you ever heard of um, uh, Brendan Manning? So Brendan Manning's this great writer. He wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. In the 70s, he was a mystic, he was a priest, um, became an alcoholic, struggled with alcohol his whole life, died as an alcoholic, loved Jesus, but just could never beat it. And he wrote this book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. <clears throat> Here's the intro to it. And I think some of you need to hear it. This book was written with a specific audience in mind. It's not for the super spiritual. It's not for the muscular Christian who has made John Wayne and not Jesus their hero. It's not for the academics who imprisoned Jesus in the ivory tower of exegesis. It's not for noisy, feel-good folks who manipulate Christianity into a naked appeal to emotion. It's not for hooded mystics who want magic in their religion. It's not for the hallelujah Christians who live only on the mountaintop and have never visited the valley of desolation. It's not for the fearless and the tearless. It's not for red, hot zealots who boast with the rich young ruler of the gospels all these commandments I have kept from my youth. It is not for the complacent who hoist over their shoulders a tote bag of honors, diplomas, and good works, actually believing they have made it. It's not for legalists who would rather surrender control of their souls to rules than run the risk of living in union with Jesus. It is, if anyone is still reading, this book was written for the bedraggled, beat up, and burnt out. It is for the sorely burdened who are still shifting the heavy suitcase from one hand to the other. It's for the wobbly and weak need who know they don't have it all together and are too proud to accept the handout of amazing grace. It is for the inconsistent, unsteady disciples. It is for poor, weak, sinful men and women with hereditary faults and limited talents. It is for earthen vessels who shuffle along on feet of clay. It is for the bent and the bruised who feel that their lives are a grave disappointment to God. It is for smart people who know they're stupid and honest disciples who admit they are scallywags. 
It is a book I wrote for myself and anyone who's grown weary and discouraged along the way. And so the gauntlet begins. Who gets in? Who's left out? Is it based on how good we are? Is it based on our life? Truly I say, the prostitutes are gonna enter the kingdom of heaven before you. And so he says in verse 13, uh uh-oh, now it gets difficult. Jacob, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. That's crazy. Pastor Kurt, (laughs) where are you, bro? (laughs) What are we gonna do with a passage like this? Okay, let me first tell you the story. So Jacob and Esau are twins. You go read the story in Genesis chapter 25 and they're born of Isaac and here's their story. Listen to Genesis 25. The first to come out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment so they named him Esau. I love how Jews name kids. So the word Esau in Hebrew is hairy, okay? So, so he's red and hairy, and they go, mm, what do we call him? Harry. Okay, perfect, right? Okay, that's, that's Esau. Comes out first, by the way. Then Jacob comes out. Genesis 25. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. You know what the word Jacob means? Heel grabber. So Harry and heel grabber. No, no, check this. So my buddy opens this donut shop in Toronto years ago. Went to seminary with him. And he called it, uh, I'll show you the logo. He called it Harry and Heels. All right, that's Jacob and Esau, man. <laughs> so if any of you are in Toronto, go check out those donuts. They're legit. All right, so <laughs> Harry and Heels. So. Um, we get all deep with our names, right? I looked up like a bunch of names the way we're naming our kids today. These names are stupid, man. (laughs) Bastion. Isander. Chesney. These are the top names of like last year. Harvest. What the heck? (laughs) Sorry if your name's Chesney, but bro, come on, change it. All right, here's the problem. So, so heel grabber, heel grabber, God loves, but Harry, Esau, God hates. Now, this is where we want to get up and leave because us modern people who sat around and drunk in our lattes and got one degree uh, first year college done have philosophically decided that God has to love in the way that we think everybody. But then Romans 9 comes out and kicks us and says, ah, he hated Esau. Hated him. Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean what what we mean by hate. Because, of course, Jesus, even in the gospel, says you have to hate your mother and father if you want to be my disciple. Right? He doesn't mean hate in the sense of like, like, like when my, uh, when I was a kid, when I was eight years old, I had this cat named Scooter and I overheard my parents saying that they were going to put it down. And so I ran out into the lake that we were on this cottage and I started to drown myself out of protest and screamed at my family, I hate you, I hate you, bring back Scooter. They killed him anyway, but uh, <laughs> that's a temper tantrum, all right? That's a temper tantrum, I hate you, I hate you. That's not what God means. He means I'm not going to do this covenant story through him, I'm going to do it through Jacob. That's what he's trying to say. I am going to save the world, but I'm not going to use both of them. I'm only going to use one of them. And so we come to the most difficult part of this, the fact that God, and Paul's point in Romans 9, is he elects, he moves first. And people much smarter than me believe different things about this, right? We choose God, God chooses us. I'm not gonna go into all that. My point is, when a Bible text comes about and says, 
something, I'm gonna hone in on that and I'm gonna do my best to teach you that versus talk about every other view in the Bible. And this confuses people because I'll just lean into one idea and then two weeks later, there'll be another idea that seems to contradict that idea and then I lean into that idea and this text is leaning into this. So however true it is, this is what it's saying, that God chose these people for salvation. He moved first and so we gotta deal with that. So I got a few things to say about that before I land this and pray for us. First thing, God seems to choose. Now, if we say to ourselves that doesn't feel right, right, as modern Westerners, it doesn't feel right for God to choose one and not the other one. That's, that's not actually, just because something doesn't feel right isn't an indication that it's right or wrong, right? Right, it might feel right to cheat on your spouse. Doesn't mean you should do it. Sometimes it feels really right. Right, like if there's been a real tension and struggle, right, over the last few months and the sex life's off and, you're, and you go to the grocery store and there's some girl there, right, she's got the Lululemon pants on, she's slapping her eyelashes around at you. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what that was. If you're just listening to this, sorry. Uh, so, uh, and she's got her eyelashes going and it starts to feel right. But nothing could be more wrong. Be careful how you feel about stuff. That can derail your life. I don't like the doctrine of hell. I understand that. Doesn't make you feel good. I don't want to fire that guy. Okay, doesn't feel good to fire a person, but it may be the right thing. I've had to do a lot of that in my life. It's not good. I'm a people person. I like everybody to like me. It's pretty hard to sit someone down and say you're gone because they don't usually like you after doesn't feel right doesn't mean it's not true. Those things are not always equated to each other. Secondly, some of us, this is a difficult idea because we feel like we, because we've grown up in the modern Western culture, we feel like we deserve salvation. We deserve it. So here's what I mean. The old, the old preacher, you guys are starting to get the clue who my favorite preacher is probably now, Charles Spurgeon. Lived in the 1800s, grew a beard. <laughs> big beard, smoked a big pipe. Called the Prince of Preachers. He said, you know, people come to me all the time and they say, this bugs me. Esau, I hate it, it bugs me. And he says, what do you mean? They say, it blows my mind that God didn't choose Esau. And Spurgeon goes, nah, you know what blows my mind? That he loved Jacob. Yeah. What do you think you deserve? If you start out being told, you're unique, like a snowflake. <laughs> Your whole life, it's called the coddling. One guy wrote it, Jonathan Hay wrote a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. You've been coddled and coddled and coddled and told, you're worth it, you're valuable, you're good, you're unique. And so what you begin to do is you begin to think the universe owes you stuff, that God owes you. But here's the crazy part. You read the Adam and Eve story, you know what's supposed to blow your mind? That God didn't just kill them both. They're done. He had one stinking rule. Just don't eat that thing. They're like, eat what? <laughs> what? And when you're reading that story, you're supposed to kind of go, gosh, you know what a better plan would have been? Wipe them out, start over. There's only two of them. <laughs> right, when you're reading that story, isn't that the thing? That gets you, there's only two of them. You can start over, right? So, take two, exactly. You're only two verses in, bro, take two. And then, and then you get, and then you get five, six chapters in, and, they, and humanity's a mess again. They're a disaster. They're raping. They're pillaging. They're doing terrible things to each other. And so God decides to wipe them all out. Kills everybody. And when you're reading that story, none of us go, "Oh, he did something wrong. He kills everybody." But then he does what? He keeps eight in the boat, and they float. And he says, I'm gonna keep you and not wipe everybody out. And every time we read that story, we go, that's grace that he did that. Amen. 
because no one deserved it. And that's why Spurgeon's saying, it depends where you, where you start. If you think God owes you something, then of course Esau I hated, or I'm not gonna do this covenant through Esau, it's gonna bug you, it's gonna keep you awake. But if you realize, my gosh, I'm sinful, and I cheat on Jesus every single day, and yet, because of him, not me, he goes, I'm gonna use you. Now you're like, okay, wow, that's all grace. Because I don't deserve it. It's called the problem of good, philosophically. Do you ever think about the problem of good? Or do you just focus on the problem of evil? Yes, the world is a terrible thing, but you don't know philosophically whether God is holding back 99.9% of how evil the universe could be. You know how good it is to get sunshine? I mean, I'm from Vancouver, so I don't know, but since I've been here the last three months, I've seen, you know how good that feels? What about art and sex and music and color and food? See, these are all the problem of good. Why is the universe as good as it is? Why did the evil get rain and sunshine? This is the grace of God. This is what Paul's trying to emphasize. Stop reading the story as if it's about you and start to read the story knowing that it's about him. Okay, third thing to say. This shouldn't actually blow our minds that much because when God starts the story of salvation, he says, Abraham, not Egypt. Not Bab- he, he chooses Abraham, right? Read Genesis 12. Abraham's walking along, he's like, oh, through you, I'm gonna redeem the world. He didn't choose some random guy from Egypt or Babylon or Assyria or Canada or America. And in that choosing, that means he didn't select the rest of the nations. That's just how it works. I'm gonna choose Abraham. Well, why don't you use Sally? Because I didn't. I use Abraham. Now, what gets difficult is when we start to think through this in regard to our salvation, which is what this sermon's actually about. And I have another about 35 minutes of context. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's where this gets difficult because we begin to say, well, this seems like God moved first. And is that true about your salvation then? And what the New Testament seems to hint at at least if we try to retain the spirit of this text, is that's exactly true. Look at Ephesians chapter two. I remember the day I read this text, I was a new Christian, I hadn't been to church yet. And I was trying to figure out what happened when I got saved. So I'm sitting out on my front porch and I'm smoking a pack of cigarettes, reading Ephesians chapter two. And this is what I read. As for you, Mark, you were what? Dead. Dead. In your trespasses and your sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who's now at work and the sons of disobedience and those whom are disobedient. And then he says, verse four, but, greatest word in the Bible. Sounds weird. Tweet that out, you know, (laughs) in isolation, kind of weird. But, greatest word in the Bible. But, when you've got a really bad diagnosis and it pivots, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, did what? Made us alive. What do dead people do? Do they think? Do they make decisions? Do they go, I shall ponder the data and I shall make a decision? (laughs) Dead. And Jesus walked up to you like Lazarus in a tomb and said, get up. He made you alive, seated us. And the thing that makes us want to reject that idea is the fact that, well, then what did I do? And it's pride and arrogance. But here's what Paul says. By grace you've been saved. And then the end of the verse. It's by grace you have been saved, undeserved favor, through faith and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, so you can't boast. You can never go, I did this. I was smart enough to figure God out, so I gave my life to Christ. He goes, no, it's really good that you gave your life to Christ. Here's the thing. When you look backward, like when I'm 17 years old, you know what happens to me on my, on my scope? Is I'm sitting there in English class, in grade 11, living my life, the drug scene, the party scene, the girl scene, the whole thing. And Chris Watt, six foot three, 
ex-drug dealer walks into the room, looks at me and goes, you need to give your life to Jesus. I have just experienced the grace of God in my life and you need to give your life to Christ. And in that moment, I'm telling you right now, something in me leapt. And I can say, I can say, oh, I thought it through, I did it all. But then you start to look back and you go, my gosh. See, Martin Luther points out, do we really have free will in the sense that we think we do? Where we can just, he goes, listen, you know what Jesus says? He comes along and he says, out of the heart comes what? Adultery, uh, sin, gossip. See, your heart didn't arrive in this world neutral where you're sitting there just making free will decisions. It's already geared toward evil and you need God to come in and save you. You don't even have... The idea of pure, natural, neutral free will is an illusion. And here's what I mean. Guys, how much YouTube, TikTok, CNN, Fox News has shaped how you think every day. Every man in here, you think you dress yourself on free will? Your wife controls you, bro. The only reason you wear what you do is because she selects it, she tells you to wear it, she tells you not to wear it, she whispers in your ear at night. I think the only person I know whose wife isn't involved in how he dresses is Kevin Thompson. You don't have free will. Every moment the world is telling you what to think. You exist in an empire that tells you, here's what sexuality is, here's what money is, here's what success is, and by the grace of God, he overcomes all of those messages and plucks you from death and gives you life. That's what Paul's saying. My kid was out in a parking lot when they were little and they started to run out and a car was coming. I grabbed them and pulled them up. They didn't go, excuse me, uh, you're violating my free will. Because I saved them from death. And we kick back. And yet the Bible so often comes along and says, how were you born again? John chapter one, you weren't born, you were born a children of God, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You didn't even know what you were doing. And he saved you by his grace. 